this is something I guess a lot of people notice but never really think about, and that is in lots of astronomical photos, stars have these nice twinkly bits to them, don't they? Little spikes sticking out, yeah. What's that all about? So it's not, it's not a, 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 first thing to say is it's not real in the sense that actually stars don't have bits sticking out to the side like that. It's an artifact of the way you take the picture. And this thing called a diffraction spike. Uh, and essentially, so we need to go back up a, talk, a little bit and talk about diffraction. Basically, diffraction is the effect where, so if you've got just a, a, a plane wave of light coming along, so just, a, just a, a plane wave, just a wave like this, right? Then, then it will just kind of propagate in a straight line forever. However, if you put an aperture in the way, then actually what happens is obviously the light that's not going through the aperture gets stopped, the light that's going through the aperture gets through, but as it comes out the other side, it spreads out on the other side. That's a phenomenon called diffraction. That whenever you block the path of light, a plane wave stops being a plane wave. And remember, a plane wave is what you get from a point-like object. So if you've got a point-like object a long way away, the light that comes to us is pretty much planar. And so that's how, you know, when you detect a plane wave, that tells you there's a point-like object back there. And when you take a picture, you see a point-like object. Of course, when it's come through the other side, it's no longer a plane wave, it's now spreading out. So if you just have a round hole, for example, a telescope, with the light going in, the diffraction you get is a famous thing called an airy pattern. You end up with a spike in the middle and then a series of rings around it. And so the diffraction pattern you would really get if you could produce the most perfect image you could with a telescope that was just a, a, a round aperture would be that structure. It would be a spike and a series of rings. You very rarely see those rings because at least when you're taking a picture from the ground, then the atmosphere messes things up to such an extent that that blurs all that out and so you lose all that. Okay, so that's the basics of diffraction. Now, unfortunately, in telescopes there are other things going on. It's not just a circular aperture. And for example, the kind of reflecting telescopes we typically use in astronomy, the big reflecting telescopes, the light comes in, bounces off a primary mirror, up to a secondary mirror. And these four pieces of metal, um, these four veins they're called, are actually holding that secondary mirror in very precise alignment. There is adjustment to it, but once the, it's collimated, um, the, the job of these four pieces of metal is to actually hold the secondary mirror in a very uh, fixed position. So you've got a big mirror at the bottom and a little mirror in, at the top. And the little mirror actually obstructs some of the light coming through. So the, uh, immediately we've got an aperture with a further obstruction in the middle of it. It turns out that's not the thing that does the, th the damage. The thing that does the damage is you need something to hold that little mirror up. So you have these things called struts, just basically supports that hold them up. In a typical telescope, there are four of them that stick out on either side, which block a bit more of the light. The light goes past them, goes past these struts, and actually diffracts because it's gone past another obstruction, and that further messes up the image. And the net effect of those struts is to create those four spikes that you see uh, on a typical telescope image. It's nothing to do with the stars themselves. It's just the wave nature of light is creating this effect. And in fact, you can even tell what the telescope is that's taking the picture sometimes because different telescopes have different support structures up there. So, for example, famously, the Keck telescopes uh, out in Hawaii, have a, a, they're built in, almost entirely on a kind of hexagonal structure, and that means they actually have six struts around their secondary mirror. And so, actually, if you look at the diffraction spikes you get from them, they're at 60-degree intervals rather than at 90-degree intervals, so you have a different pattern of diffraction just depending on what the, the, the pattern of the struts is, how the struts are arranged around. If you think about just one strut, as the light goes past it, of course, you've got a plane wave of light approaching this strut, you'll have a plane wave comes past here, a plane wave comes past here, this bit in the middle where the strut was gets blocked. And so again what happens, as the light goes past the strut, it starts to spread out on the other side. So the light that gets past, because it's now gone past an obstruction, will start to spread out on the other side, so it'll cease to be a plane wave. And the light that's spreading out from this side and the light that's spreading out from this side all interferes with each other. And so the net effect of all that interference is to produce those big spikes that you see. You can minimise the effects by actually using curved veins, or like the gentle S-shaped ones, because the light doesn't diffract around them quite so clearly. To be perfectly honest, with a telescope like this, the diffraction spikes don't really cause that much of a problem. With this telescope, unlike my last one, which had a similar setup, the diffraction spikes are very, very delicate, and they're, they're very easy to, to, you could process them out of an image if you wish to. It's kind of an important thing if you're designing a telescope, to actually see, well, what's this going to do to my telescope? So at the moment, for example, we're going through these design phases with the next generation of the extremely large telescopes, the, the European extremely large telescopes, the one I've been most involved with. And one of the things people have been very worried about is, well, what's the pattern of these diffraction spikes and other things going to be? Because one of the things we want to do with that telescope is be able to detect exoplanets, detect, make images of planets going around other stars. And obviously, if you've got a bright star and a little planet next to it, if we're not careful, you could end up wiping out that image of the little planet next to it with a whacking great diffraction spike. So quite a lot of work goes into trying to minimise the impact of these diffraction effects. It is possible to actually put diffraction spikes on afterwards. I mean, there's two ways of doing it, actually. If you have a telescope that doesn't have 
these, these veins holding a secondary mirror, you can put pieces of string across and you get the same effect. You're just creating your own diffraction spikes. Pieces of dowel, for example, things like that. It is possible. But there's even software in the, uh, available now that allows you to do that. It looks at your image and it picks out the bright stars and it puts, and you can rotate the angle of the, uh, the spikes. You can make them bigger or smaller. I don't see much point in that myself. I mean, they're there. They're a, they're a fact of life with this telescope and they're not too much of a problem. But I think Why do people do it? What? Well, if you imagine objects like the, uh, the Pleiades star cluster, they, they do look quite, quite attractive. All these multiple stars with, um, with uh, you know, these kind of diffraction spikes on. It, it certainly makes astronomical images look prettier. There's no denying it. It's nice bright stars with nice little diffraction spikes look very pretty indeed. I've got mixed opinions on them. If they're there, if, if the telescope creates them, I don't have a problem with that. I don't think I'd really go out of my way to, to put them on artificially. Um, but yeah, when you come to do the science, they are a pain. How do you get around that pain? Is there like... So is there like a way to correct for them or? Not really. So, I mean, you know, one of the things you can always do with your telescope, so supposing, for example, you've got, you know, you've got a bright star next to the object you're interested in and the diffraction spike is wiping out the object you're interested in. Of course, one of the things you can do is just rotate the telescope a bit and that's going to move the diffraction spikes around. So you can get them out of the way that way. So there's things you can do to mitigate the effects of them. Um, but generally, you just have to live with them. That's something you do though, is it? Like yeah, yeah, you can arrange for the diffraction to be, spikes to be in such a way that they don't actually wipe out the things that you're most interested in doing. And is that part of the pre-planning process or do you do it on the fly? It, it should be part of the pre-planning process. Sometimes it's only when you take the picture and think, oh no, and then you have to go back and think, well actually let's tie the, the whole thing in a slightly different orientation. If you're using, for example, a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope that has an optical window, a specially shaped piece of lens, if you like, at the front end, the secondary mirror is actually held in the middle of that. So with a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, you don't actually get any diffraction spikes. The other thing is actually, so if you have a very old style refracting telescope, so one of the ones with lenses, of course, the way they work, the light just goes straight through from one end to the other. So you don't have this issue of having to support a secondary. So actually, if you take a picture with a refracting telescope, you don't get diffraction spikes at all.